Hello, everyone. My name is William Mucker. I am a client executive with Camaplan, and I would like to thank you all for joining us for today's webinar, Questions Investors Must Ask Before Passively Investing in Real Estate, with Denise Piazza, Managing Partner of One Street Capital. As a quick note, please be aware that Denise will be answering questions at the end of the presentation. However, feel free to use the chat and Q&A functions um, to pose your questions whenever they cross your mind. They will be saved and addressed once the presentation portion ends and the Q&A portion begins. Before we get started, I do have a brief disclosure to go through. Everything presented in today's webinar is strictly for educational purposes. Camaplan is a neutral third-party administrator of IRAs. We are not attorneys, CPAs, or financial advisors. If it comes to a time where you need advice in any one of those fields, we highly recommend you consult with your team of professionals. We are more than happy to be a part of the dialogue with your team of professionals to make sure the investment process is quick and seamless. We do not sell any investments at Camaplan, nor do we endorse any products. We will never call you about the next best investment opportunity. We believe that you should always do your own due diligence before investing your money, whether it be your retirement funds or otherwise. Once you have found the investment that is right for you, we will help you open your account, fund that account, and facilitate the transaction into that investment. Here is my contact information. If you or anyone that you know uh, believe can benefit from the information, um, have any questions about what is discussed in today's presentation and how it applies to self-direction, please do not hesitate to contact me or Camaplan. We would be more than happy to help. And without further ado, I'm going to pass the controls over to Denise. Great. Thank you so much for having me, Will. It's nice chatting with the Cam and Plan crew again. Um, I actually had Will on a webinar a few months back, so it's great to be here. And thank you, everyone, for joining and just taking some time out of your day or just taking your time to listen to this. I do appreciate it um, and happy to, to help and answer any questions people might have. Um, so I think many of us are here because we're interested in investing in real estate or we've already invested in real estate assets. And we know that there are great means to diversifying your portfolio, act as a good inflation hedge, uh, and can provide above market returns without as much volatility. But I'm here to talk about uh, more about how we can feel comfortable that we're investing intelligently and how to perform better due diligence when investing passively into real estate offerings. So when I say investing passively, I just mean placing your funds into a real estate investment uh, opportunity as opposed to going out and purchasing a property on your own. Um, although some of the, the you know metrics and things that I'll talk about today um, do apply to that um, active, more active real estate investing as well. So, well, if you can jump to the next slide. So here's just um, a real quick background about me uh, for everyone. I began working with real estate over 20 years ago when I had several clients um, with real estate investments. I was working at an accounting firm. And while I was preparing returns for some of my highest net worth clients, I noticed one of the common denominators across their portfolios was real estate. I knew it was something I wanted to have in my own portfolio. And then fast forward a few years later, my husband and I, who are both CPAs, which um, we actually tell everyone that if you have any ever have problems falling asleep, please call us and we can tell you all about our day. Um, but we actually began investing in real estate across multiple different asset classes. We had single family, bought um, office space, um, invested in triple net leases, retail commercial space, and multifamily, which is uh, essentially apartments um, and those types of assets over the years. More uh, recently, I have been um, a lot more focused on commercial size apartment investments, um, but what I didn't realize at the time that I began investing is um, how to properly evaluate those real estate investments. I learned after a few investments how to better uh, perform that analysis and to do some due diligence before funding an investment. So today, I really just like to share some of these steps and things I've learned along the way in hopes that it can help you avoid uh, some of the earlier mistakes that I made. Um, and Will, if you can jump to the next slide for me. Great. So here's my checklist of some key steps to take in order to help improve your success rate when invest, investing passively in real estate. 
Um, and it will also help just reduce your overall risks in these um, investment opportunities. So one, um, one area that I find to be very important in investments is to find ways to increase that know, like, and trust factor before investing with a group. Um, and some ways you can actually actively try to do this is scheduling time with one of the partners to ask them some of the various questions that we're about to discuss, um, ask them for referrals of other investors and or some sample investor communication that they, uh, that they send out to their investors. Um, you'd be surprised at how few people actually ask for investor referrals before funding an investment. Um, and I think it's such an important part of the process uh, is really just trying to increase that way, those ways that you can get to know the team and how they operate. Um, and one thing that we're gonna spend some time talking about today is just asking the right questions before investing and doing your own due diligence on an opportunity and the market where you're investing in and the team that is presenting that investment offering. And then lastly, we're gonna um, touch on uh, uh, the track record. And it might sound a bit strange in saying this, but one thing that I've learned is that you don't wanna just simply rely on the success of previous investments that, this, that a particular group has done. So meaning how they performed on prior properties and what people refer to essentially as their track record. And the reason why I say this, it so sounds a bit, you know, out there, but over the last decade, it's been pretty easy to show some great returns on investments. Uh, the market, the real estate market was extremely hot with interest rates at historically low levels um, and the demands for those assets um, incredibly strong. So should you just, should you ask for the team's track record? Absolutely. But my point is, is you really don't wanna take that track record at face value. You wanna do some additional steps um, and, and by asking the right questions that we'll discuss and, and knowing what makes a good investment opportunity. So I like to say these are the steps that you're taking to trust, um, but verify. And next, uh, on the next slide, we'll talk about the uh, three pillars that we, um, that we have to real estate investing. And so once you know the assets, the types of assets you want to invest in, the next uh, question that you know I tend to ask myself is how do you know it's a good deal? Um, I've invested in multiple properties across different asset classes, as I mentioned, and I've had some great and some not so good experiences um, in these ex investments. But based on my on all of my experience, what I've come up with is that there's three overall pillars to any real estate investment opportunity. And one of those is the market itself. So where you're investing um, in, in a particular property. Investing in a good location and a sh with a strong market, with strong market dynamics, really it reduces your overall investment risk. Um, and we'll talk away about different ways where you can measure the, the dynamics of a particular market. And the second item is the deal itself and those financial projections that are being presented. Um, I've come up with some red flags to be on the lookout for when reviewing financial data and return projections. Um, and the last factor is that the team that's operating the assets. And this is one that often gets overlooked, but is so critical to the success of the property itself and the business plan um, that, that they, that's going to be executed and ultimately your overall investment returns. So a great team, I always say, can turn an average deal into a home run, but on the contrary, a bad operator can turn a great property into a dud. Um, and remember that when you're purchasing a real estate asset that you're really purchasing a business. So you need people that can effectively operate that business and execute their plan for um, that particular property. Next slide, please, Will. The metrics, um, the first pillar that I discussed that I mentioned really reduce your overall risk in investing is um, investing in a strong growth market um, with certain dynamics that investors should be on the lookout for um, when they're purchasing property. So you want to buy in an area that meets these um, criteria. You know, you may have to, um, you know, not have 
above average on all of these criteria, but you want to make sure that it hits at least, um, you know, four or five of these metrics. So when you think about things like population growth and job growth, um, those are things that are attracting people into an area. So if um, there's people moving to an area, you can feel comfortable that, um, you know, there's going to be enough tenants, for example, if you're investing in a multifamily property, there's going to be enough tenants to actually fill those properties. Or if you're investing in retail, that there's going to be people that are out shopping and doing things um, within that particular area, because the more people move to an area, that's going to drive your overall appreciation. Um, the employment industry diversity is one that can get overlooked, but is so critical because you want to make sure there's multiple industries within a particular uh, market's economy so that if one industry were to collapse, um, your all of your um, people within that particular market are not going to be out of a job. Um, you know, one classic example was the Detroit um, uh, real estate market and their heavy reliance on the auto industry. So with that, you just want to make sure that no particular industry is dominant in terms of employing residents. Uh, you also really um, can consider the strength of the school system and um, the level of crime in that particular area. So again, it sort of just blends itself to when people um, when there's a good school districts and there's a, a low crime rate, um, people want to move to those areas. That's where they want to be. That's where they want to migrate to. And again, it just speaks to uh, the strength of the appreciation that you'll see in that property. And also, um, ultimately, your uh, overall reducing your risk that the property's value will decline. And Will, if you could just jump to the next slide, too. And the key questions on um, the, the actual investment market itself. Um, so let's assume you're looking for a property in a growth oriented market, one with a history of appreciation, low property taxes and a growing economy. So because the team should have done thorough research, they should be able to tell you why they're investing in a particular market. And you want to make sure that they're presenting some real numbers to support their choice. So some stats that should be included are job growth in the area, median household income to make sure um, people can afford the property. Um, you want to look at population growth, as we mentioned. And then if this type of information isn't included in what they're presenting to their investor base, you know, I want to ask some questions about the market. I want to know things like, is it within a school, good school district? What's the crime rate? Um, are all of these, because ultimately all these factors um, greatly increase the value of your property. Um, you should also be asking about other projects that are taking place within the market that they're purchasing. So, and how those projects could affect the returns um, of their acquisition. So, this is really speaking to the supply and demand in a particular market. You wanna ensure that they know how much supply is being built and how that will impact the market's absorption of that new supply of real estate property within the area. So just like anything else, if a market is oversupplied without enough demand, it can certainly have a negative impact on your financial uh, projections. And another key question that we ask about is their particular experience in that market. So if the sponsorship team that you're investing with or their property management team that they're working with have a proven track record of, of success in that area, it's gonna increase your odds of uh, the success of the property. So what it means to me is that they know that market. They know um, if I'm investing in an apartment complex, they know that we know that the tenants, what the tenants want in terms of renovations, what sort of amenities uh, they want at a property, and what the competition in that market offers them. Um, it also shows me that they've been able to successfully execute their business plan within that particular area. And next, we're going to talk about the uh, financial projections associated with, it, uh, with an investment. So are the opportunities that I've seen have varied widely. 
Um, and you should really try to clarify as many details as you can before you sign off on the paperwork. So the most obvious questions you wanna be, um, you wanna have answered up front is how much capital you, should, you can invest, what's the potential cash flow and returns, and how long you'll need to keep your money in the deal. Um, you wanna move beyond the outline of the deals though and ask the sponsor um, how they determine their timeline, um, how often their payouts are distributed, and what they'll do if the, ha the market happens to soften um, during the time that they're holding the deal or if interest rates rise um, as they have over the last several months and how they're gonna pivot and react to that uh, particular scenario. And what are, all, what are all their exit or refinance plans? So in my days of um, being an auditor, we have this concept that I mentioned of trust but verify. So when I'm looking at an opportunity, I wanna make sure I'm comfortable with a few key co uh, components of the deal. Um, and the first of which, and to me is one of the most important, um, important metrics is the debt structure. So how much debt are they using to acquire the property? Um, many new investors are only reviewing the return structure. Um, so what am I gonna make on the deal? And I'm guilty of that when I first started investing as well. But the reality is the most riskiest investments in real estate are those with just too much debt. Um, it increases the odds of an owner losing a property or something um, more catastrophic, you know, happening and then not being able to withstand um, that particular uh, situation. So remember, I'm focused um, in this scenario largely on housing or multifamily investments, and, and they are historically the most recession resilient asset classes, but you still want to make sure that an asset is not over leveraged. Another item um, to, con to consider is a preferred return. Um, and the preferred return essentially just ensures that the operator, the one actually managing the property um, that you're investing with, doesn't get paid until this preferred return is reached. So for example, if it's an opportunity with a 10% preferred return, the operator essentially gets nothing until that return is reached. Um, and it aligns your interests in the, with the investors um, so that they get the preferred distributions and the operator is, you know, as I mentioned, really getting nothing until at least that minimum return is achieved. And lastly, there's key assumptions that are being made every time um, somebody's acquiring a property. So you want to make sure there's some thought behind these assumptions and look for third party support for these areas. Um, I also make sure that people are stress testing, uh, you know, various assumptions. So stress test interest rates, stress test valuations at exit, um, and all those key areas. Because if your assumptions are too aggressive or unrealistic, your financial uh, returns that they're presenting you are not going to be realistic as well. So could it still be a decent return? Absolutely but you won't be optimizing your investment dollars and mitigating the risk so that you're investing in the best possible real estate opportunity. Um, and if the market should not be in your favor at the time you wanna refinance or sell the property, again, it's just introducing more risk to your hard-earned capital. Next slide, please. So these are some of the questions um, we address when, um, when talking about an investment opportunity. Um, the first, as I said, the debt, overall debt structure. So we wanna make sure that the, um, the debt, the debt uh, it, you know, the asset itself, I should say, is not too heavily um, over levered. Well, what people are, are doing now in the market is we're, you know, tend to take on less debt and um, you know, raise more private capital or institutional capital to fund investments because um, they recognize with higher interest rates, um, it's, just, it's just more risky to have um, a higher uh, loan to value. So that debt, the debt amount to how much the value of the property is. Um, you wanna look at their interest rate and um, I like to make sure it's a fixed interest rate, um, especially in the market that we're, get, that we're in right now. There's been a lot of recent volatility. Um, and so you wanna make sure that that interest rate is locked in. Uh, you want to look at the liquidity of the asset and how long they're expecting to take until you get your capital back. 
Um, we talked a bit about the returns and what a preferred return is, and you want to ask them, does it accrue? So if they are in year one of the acquisition and they have a preferred return of 10%, but you received 7% um, in that first year for your cash that you receive from distributions, does that remaining delta, the 3%, get accrued until um, the following year of the hold. And so you wanna make sure that it does. Um, you know, some of the key assumptions that I discussed are, um, that we discuss are our rent projections reasonable when we're investing in, in things like multifamily apartment assets. What is their projection for the value of the property at the time they expect to refinance or sell? Um, and that's, a key determination for the time frame of when they expect to give you your capital back and for you to receive your returns. So you want to look at the valuation of the property that they're assuming um, at the, that time of refinance or sale and make sure it's reasonable compared to how much income the property has grown or uh, achieved during the hold period. And the last uh, area that we'll discuss is the uh, the team. And uh, Will, if you could just jump to the next slide, that would be great. So the team um, and asking the right questions on how they operate and how they perform. Um, generally, the management team's credentials are often the most overlooked aspect of any real estate offering. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I'm just as guilty when I first started investing, I, you know, would jump to see how much um, returns, uh, you know, were being promised and um, what I could expect um, in terms of timing, but didn't really focus as much on the team itself and the types of properties that they and experience that they have had in the past and how they operate and communicate with their investors. So, you know, you want to get behind some of the, the surface levels and see how, um, you know, because often personalities tend to get lost in paperwork and and research, but make no mistake, the team is the most important part of commercial real estate investing. So you want to find out the experience your sponsors have had in a real estate market and how they've dealt with adversity um, and hiccups what they've run into when operating a property. Ensure they have a proper team, so attorneys, brokers, CPAs, um, and then don't be afraid, as I mentioned, to ask for investor references or to do a background check or, you know, ask um, about, you know, how they work and interact with their investor community. And another area that I really like to focus on and it often gets overlooked is how they actually manage their property. So these are usually metrics that they use um, to track what's going on in terms of financial performance and um, the overall success of the property. So they're often referred to as KPIs, which are key performance indicators. Um, as I mentioned, I've been focused uh, heavily on uh, multifamily investing. And so some of the, um, the key performance indicators that I look for are things around, um, you know, what are their leading indicators for performance and what are their lagging? Something that would be leading is what's the current occupancy of the property today? And then a lagging um, I'm sorry, that would be the lagging indicator. And the leading indicator is, you know, based on the new leases that you have coming online, how much do you expect the occupancy to be over the 30, 30 60, 90 day time frame? Um, and there's a lot of other metrics like net operating income, which is just how much money they're actually making after all paying all the expenses on the property. Um, how are their, um, how are they adhering to their budget and what they projected to um, make in terms of income? But real estate is just like any other business and the best teams usually create the best outcomes. So you wanna make sure that you're investing with a management team with experience and that they're prepared for changes in the market. And well, if you could just jump to the next slide. Okay, so this is, um, this is my team. Uh, one of the drivers, as I mentioned, for me starting our um, business, One Street Capital, was to really take all the experiences that we had had through these investments um, and focus on providing our, our investors with the knowledge and the, um, the information that allows them to you know, identify best opportunities and to ask the right questions when trying to um, invest in, in a real estate offering. 
So fast forward to today, our company, we have over 900 units um, under management and have invested in hundreds of millions of dollars of um, transactions as limited partners as well. So um, we've been on both the passive and the active side of these investments. And then if you could jump to the summary slide, Will. So hopefully some of the questions that we talked about today and that are presented here have sparked some new ways of thinking about um, potential investments and deal sponsors. So when you're looking at these prospective uh, investments, just remember that no question is off limits. Um, do some of your own due diligence and ask what you need to um, of the syndication sponsor before you invest. Um, if somebody's not getting back to me or not giving me information before I invest, I can only imagine what it's going to mean for after I've invested with them and they already have my capital. Um, you should feel comfortable with the investment deal and the sponsor before signing uh, documentation. And if the deal sponsor, as I said, you know, sort of brushes you off, take that as an indication of how the relationship will be throughout the life cycle of the deal. It's likely that financial returns may be what initially attracted you, but before you jump in, take your time to vet the opportunity and the sponsor and focus on things that might not be so clearly written on paper, um, like personalities and integrity. So you can feel confident that you are um, you know, investing in, in it. Um, you've thoroughly done your research before investing in a real estate uh, project. And that's pretty much all that I had, Will. Um, I'm happy to open it up to questions. Um, I've had, I have my contact information listed here. Um, should anybody you know, want to reach out separately for questions, but I'm to, happy to answer anything live as well. Great. Thank you so much for all that information. It was, it was a very deep dive on, on the basics, and I really appreciate that. Um, I, like I said, I highly encourage people in the chat um, to use the chat and the Q&A function to ask any questions for Denise while we have her time. Um, please don't be shy. Um, we do have a question coming in from MJ. If you're not an accredited investor, how should we approach someone like you for investments that might be right for our needs? Sure. So um, if you're not accredited, there's something called 506B offerings. Um, and so 506B offerings um, allow... A, uh, not a percentage of investors that don't meet the accreditation status. And so the important thing that you really just have to do before being able to invest in one of those 506B offerings is to an establish a relationship with the sponsor. So you have to actually have a phone call, have a discussion. You want to make sure that um, they're asking you about, you know, just what your overall investing goals and experience are. So um, usually people provide opportunities to schedule time with them um, on their website. So you can always do that and set up some um, set up some one on one time to establish that relationship, which would allow you to participate in um, 506B offerings. Perfect, thanks for that clarification, Denise. Um, while people are still thinking uh, of questions to come up, um, I have a question. How long do you generally take, whether it be personally or when you or your team are, are going through this due diligence process, how long do you guys usually spend before you're comfortable in, in, in plunging into a, a certain offering? Sure. So I, um, before we, so there's, I guess there's two answers. So there's the answer for me um, as an active um, investor. And that's when I present something to um, our real estate investing community. And that's um, basically several months <laughs> that we do our due diligence on before we take the um, before we take the next step and we want to make an acquisition on a property and be a, um, a lead sponsor of that property. And basically it's because, you know, we have very stringent investing criteria. We're investing our capital and obviously capital of folks um, that we know, like, and trust and our friends and family. And so we want to make sure that we can check all the boxes um, in our due diligence checklist that we go through before we invest in a particular market, in a particular property. And so, um, you know, that process alone can take months because you have to identify the deal, you have to go through initial underwriting stages, 
um, you know, we'll go out and do multiple visits. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's, a, it's a long process. And then as a passive investor, I would say, you know, admittedly, when I first started investing, I, it didn't take me long to review at all. <laughs> you know, I might listen to a webinar and look at a presentation and, um, you know, I, I barely asked any questions. So now that I've been doing this for years, I feel as though um, I have the right tools in my tool belt to ask uh, questions about key assumptions and the team itself and, you know, some of the things that we talked about today. So I won't invest with anyone that, you know, I, um, that won't answer those questions and won't, you know, I don't, can't, you know, point to some, um, to some support for their assumptions. Of course. Yes. And I appreciate the longer you guys spend on, on making sure the deal is right for you. That makes me feel even more comfortable. We look, it looks like we have a two part question coming in sure. from Scott. Are you in the local Philly market? And then the second part to that is what are the basic size of your investments and what is the minimum investment in your normal syndication? Yes. So um, Scott, I am geographically local to the Philly market, although I have not historically invested um, uh, in terms of multifamily here in that market. I have some, um, some, you know, some uh, single family and I have commercial I have investments in commercial um, retail space, but have not done much in the multifamily side. The, the um, multifamily assets that I tend to target for our acquisitions and investments are those in areas that have really strong population growth trends um, and job growth trends, and truthfully, just some areas that are a little bit more landlord friendly. So, um, you know, that it reduces our risk that. If something happens, as we all saw during um, COVID and there was the eviction moratorium, but eventually, you know, if somebody is not able to pay their rent, we have to be able to be in a situation where we can, um, you know, and we've, you know, re repeatedly requested them to, um, to pay and, you know, the delinquency, there's delinquency, we need to be able to evict that tenant. So, you know, from an overall investment risk, I like to invest in areas that are more landlord friendly. And then I can see that there's a question about the basic size of your investment um, and what's the minimum investment in your normal syndication. So I'd say our last few syndications, we had a 50,000 on average uh, minimum investment. Um, the last syndication that we did, we were raising about $15 million in total um, with our operating partners. So it wasn't just one street capital, it was another group as well. Um, and then prior to that, um, our, our trying to think back our previous opportunity before that was about a $20 million equity raise across, um, you know, several large and, and different size based investors. Perfect. Thank you for clarifying Scott's question. Scott, thank you for the question. Another question just came in from Donna. What due diligence would you do differently when investing in new builds that don't have a prior track record on return? So um, new builds, um, I guess, so the, the development side is um, a different animal. And I, you know, I have invested in new development, um, but basically, you know, you want to think about the fact that when there's new development, it should be higher risk um, and then higher reward. <laughs> so you want to make sure that your um, investment returns are um, are higher in those types of opportunities because you're essentially not going to be getting any return on your capital until they have um, successfully completed uh, development of the property. And, you know, even though it might be a newer property, you can still um, check the track record of the team who's acquiring that property or developing or acquiring that property because of the fact that team will have a track record. So it's not necessarily the property itself. Um, it's really the people that are operating it and that have an idea of how they're going to increase the income from that property or achieve the return that they're um, that they're claiming to be able to achieve and how they can get there. So even if it's a newer build property, you can still um, look to the team that's acquiring it um, and leading that main property um, acquisition and see what they've done in the past. Awesome. Thank you, Denise. And thank you for the question, Donna. Another question coming in from Karen. 
does your company offer 506B, excuse me, investment opportunities? Um, sure. So from time to time, we do offer 506B opportunities. We did one um, last year in 2022. Um, so yes, but you know, I will say we we are, are the last two opportunities that we had were open to accredited investors and were 506C opportunities. Um, but we have done 506Bs as well. Great. Um, Donna says, thank you. Have you used or recommended using a platform like TriVest? And, and thank you, Karen, for the question as well. Sure. So I have not personally used TriVest. I know others have. Um, and, you know, I think the concept of group investing is, is great. Um, I think, you know, it allows you to um, get involved at maybe uh, smaller amounts than you might want to when you're just testing the waters. So um, I personally have not used TriVest, but I have not heard any negative feedback um, from, from my, you know, from folks that I've uh, worked with. Thank you, Denise. And Hopefully that Denise. helps. <laughs> I hope so. I, it, it sounded very, uh, very helpful in my opinion. Um, another question coming in from Scott. I'm assuming you are the sponsor and what is your normal hold time on a multifamily syndication? Sure. So I would say um, when we're doing our projections, we're looking at a three to five year time frame for holding the property. Um, it really does depend on um, when we expect to either refinance or sell and what the market is doing. So we usually have multiple exit plans. Um, so, you know, if interest rates do this, this is how we're going to react. And if interest rates go here and, you know, properties, um, you know, have to be able to, or the teams have to be able to pivot and to adjust to market conditions, just like you see happening right now um, in, in the environment that we're in with higher interest rates than we've seen in, in since the 80s, <laughs> you know, with the velocity increases since the 80s. So, um, so yeah, you just, you know, typically it's a three to five year hold that we're expecting. Um, but, you know, you also want to make sure that the team itself um, has, you know, multiple exit strategies and, and can pivot accordingly should something not go exactly to plan. Great. Thank you, Denise. And thank you, Scott, for the questions. Any, uh, any more questions for Denise or, or even for me, if it, if it applies to self-direction or anything that Denise spoke about today, um, please let them be known now. Um, if not, we're going to, we're going to end it up, pretty, uh, wrap it up pretty soon. Uh, well, one other thing I'll just offer to the group is I um, I did put out this subset of questions that are on the presentation, but um, if you go to our website, you can see the full document there. Um, you can download it. It's um, on, listed on our website, onestreetcapital.com, and we have uh, 50, over 50 questions on that document. So just, you know, if you want to use it to help, you know, even obviously, if, even if it's not with us, if it just helps you be a better um, investor and better help you to do your due diligence, um, that would be great. Perfect. Thank you, Denise. We have, it looks like we have potentially our last question coming in from Scott. Track, track record for the last few couple of years may be skewed due to recent major increase in, increase in prices. How are you planning on a possible different market in the next year or so? Yeah, so that's exactly why I like to tell people not to rely solely on their, you know, a team's track record. You want to do your own due diligence, ask the right questions. Um, and yes, I agree. It's been easy to look very successful in the last 10 years. So, you know, you, for me, I personally, before I work with another group, I will look at how their pro forma, um, how what they expected to, um, to execute on a deal and how much income they expected that property to make on an annual basis look like compared to what actually happened. Um, and I think that helps speak to whether or not they were able to successfully achieve their business plan or did the market just kind of bail them out because the market was so hot at the time. Um, and then how I plan on, um, I, I plan on it being a different market right now is because I think there's a lot of opportunity. Um, you know, the, the lovely thing about real estate is that um, you can marry your um, property, but date your interest rate. So with interest rates um, being so high, 
you know, I think it's a good time to, to get in on a property. And I think at some point in the near future, um, I do believe personally, I don't have the crystal ball, but they'll come down at least some. And so that will give you an opportunity to um, get an even more attractive rate. But even absent of that, you know, what I like about a lot of the deals that I um, am invested in is that you can, we are forcing appreciation on a property. So even if the market has softened, we're still increasing our net operating income for that property by doing things that the property um, is not doing currently. So we're implementing um, fiber stream and putting Wi-Fi packages in at properties, which essentially are a win-win for both the the tenants and the um, the owners themselves, because the tenants get a faster, more reliable, and a more cost-effective Wi-Fi package, um, versus you know, um, and the owner wins as well because they're they're paying to put that um, that package in, but then they're making a, a return on investment by how much you know they're able to charge the tenant for that um, Wi-Fi package. Um, the other things that we're doing is we're being very focused on what the market um, in that particular area is, is driving for renovations. So, you know, we're um, performing renovations on property so that we can um, essentially increase rents because they might be um, a, a property that has not been updated in the last 10 to 15 years in terms of the interiors. So those are the, some of the things that we do to um, you know, force appreciation so that we're not strictly relying on uh, market fundamentals. Amazing, thank you for your insight, Denise. Uh, sure. Thank you for another question, Scott. I appreciate you, Denise, for lending us your time and your knowledge today and all the information you provided. Thank you to everybody in the audience for again, lending your time to us and, 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 uh, and asking great questions. Denise, um, while, when we leave off, is there anything that you and your team are working at on now that you're particularly excited about or anything you want to leave the viewers that are in the, the audience now or that may be watching this recording later with? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a few properties that we're working on. I'd say the first few months of the year were a little bit slower, but now we're starting to see things pick up and we're looking at a few really exciting um, opportunities that we're going to uh, pursue in the next um, few weeks. So yeah, you, if you are interested, please, you know, we have um, an investing community. And um, if you sign up on our website, onestreetcapital.com, you can be in the know on um, any future opportunities that, that um, we provide. Awesome. Thank you. I highly recommend that you, you guys take advantage of the contact information on your screen now, if you have any questions that you may not have thought about for Denise. Um, or anybody who was not able to attend this webinar and is watching the recording. Again, one last thank you to Denise and everybody in the audience. And if you have any questions about self-direction that, that Cama Plan can help out with, please do not hesitate to contact us, any, at, us at any time. Um, we are more than happy to help. And I hope everybody has a great rest of their day. Thank you, Will. Have a good one. You do the same. Thanks.